started. We're on the hour. Always good to start on time. So um, hello and welcome to Centre Think Tank's event on rewilding. Uh, I'm going to be chairing this event. I'm Will Barber Taylor. I'm the head of events and podcasts at Centre. Um, and this event is going to look at what rewilding is, uh, how we can address concerns about it and what the future of rewilding looks at. So joining us today, we have a, a fantastic uh, panel of guests, uh, Zach Plansky, um, who I'd like to just congratulate on his recent election as deputy leader of the Green Party. Uh, he also sits as a Green member of the London Assembly. Uh, we also have Steve Micklewright, the Ooh. governor of the Scottish Rewilding Alliance and CEO of Trees for Life. And finally, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Dr. Simon Bilcliffe, who's founder and CEO of Webmart, uh, which is part of a, a business that rewilds land. Uh, and he's also uh, a board member of the Yorkshire Party and co-leader of the Yorkshire Party. So um, as I said at the start, uh, if people do want to ask questions, please ask them in the chat. And I'd also like to say to our panel, um, if we could uh, keep responses to around five minutes or so, or, or just under, so that we've got enough time for the Q&A at the end. So the first question I'd like to put to Steve, um, rewilding often isn't well defined and it can be interpreted in a multitude of different ways. What do you think rewilding is? Oh, Steve, you're muted. <laughs> Hang on. Can you unmute him? Sorry. <laughs> I think it. Oh, yeah. That should be it. Sorry, I I <laughs> muted myself and I couldn't unmute myself. But I think Torin sort of. Huge apologies. So that was a good start, wasn't it? <laughs> um, thanks, Will. Um, I suppose the simplest definition of rewilding is about working with nature instead of against it. I suppose um, we've spent a lot of our lives as humans, a lot of our history as humans, kind of working with nature, thinking that we can rule it and and uh, and and bend it to our will. But rewilding uh, encourages a different way of thinking about nature and trying to work with it. It's often about ecological restoration, enabling nature to recover so it can eventually take care of itself. That's another uh, phrase you hear quite a lot. And it, it really means about allowing natural process, processes to happen. So, for example, re restoring peatlands so they can help us lock away carbon, enabling forests to grow themselves instead of planting lots of plantations. Again, helping to lock away carbon, providing great habitat for nature. Another one is about allowing these things that we call keystone species species that have a big impact on their surroundings, like beavers, to, to do a lot of our work for us, such as holding back flood, flood water for free. Um, and the most effective forms of rewilding look at it quite holistically. So, uh, you know, it can very definitely help us with both the biodiversity and climate crises. Nature can help to restore our world very much so. But also, I think really good rewilding, really holistic rewilding also thinks about people and where people sit within that. And that's about human well-being. And it's also about kind of nature based economies, creating livelihoods with people in a natural landscape so that we can sustainably um, uh, yield stuff that's good from the land. Uh, and I suppose that's that's uh, lots of debate over what it actually is, but that I think kind of captures captures it for me. Oh no, Will's muted now. What's that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, uh, that 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 was like good. But no, I think that was a great de um, description, um, Steve. And I'd, I'd like to turn now to um, Zach. Uh, first, um, because I mean, rewilding is one of the um, uh, elements um, that is often associated with tackling climate change, which is obviously, the, you know, the, the, one of the biggest and most complex challenges we face, not just in this country, but um, around the world. So, Zach, how do you think um, rewilding can fit exactly into the uh, larger objective of tackling global warming? Thank you very much, Will, and thank you for having me on the podcast of the event uh, uh, today. Uh, I very much agree with everything Steve just said, and I think that was a really good introduction to this question as well. I particularly want to highlight what he said about people and being part of the ecosystem, because I think in conversations that often gets missed out. And actually, we really need to protect nature and green space for wildlife, and that is a vital part of rewilding. But actually, we all, we all need green space and we all need nature for our mental health as well. 
And I think that's a huge aspect that, that can often get missed in this conversation. So I'm really pleased that's at the, the forefront. Um, in the Green Party, we often talk about the fact that there's no environmental justice without social justice too. And the reason why I talk about that is because all of these things are interlinked. And that's because so often the people who are most risk of the damaging effects of the climate emergency are the people who have done the least to cause it and are least resilient to it. So we could look at that from an international perspective and countries in the global south, uh, places like Pakistan at the moment that have huge areas underwater. In fact, there's areas that the size of the UK that are currently underwater in Pakistan. And these are the results of extreme weather. Now, extreme weather itself is not the climate emergency, but the frequency of extreme weather events that we're seeing and the unprecedented events that we're frequently seeing are examples of the climate emergency. And we're also seeing that in the UK as well, particularly around wildfires. In fact, in London, the London Fire Brigade just had their worst day since World War II, and also crucially for this conversation, flooding. So we need, we know we need more suds and what suds mean is sustainable urban drainage systems. Essentially, we need to be planting more trees, making sure that there's more green space and less gray space. And that's a good way of making sure that rivers don't, uh, don't flood. So to answer your question in terms of how does rewilding uh, relate to the climate emergency, it's a long way of getting around to the actual answer, which is saying that it both mitigates for it. So it reduces uh, emissions. Trees can be um, carbon sinks, so they can actually take in carbon rather than emitting carbon. And peatlands as well are a huge part of that because when they're damaged, they actually release carbon into the atmosphere. Whereas when we're allowing them to do what they should naturally be doing, they're removing carbon. So in many ways, it's a way of saying, let's stop interfering with nature and actually let nature do its thing. It's very, very well designed and a lot more clever than we could ever possibly imagine. So we should allow it to get on with that. And as well as mitigation, there's also adaptation. So there's a point where the climate emergency has now got so bad that we can't you know, give up and we can't get complacent. There's lots of things we can't reverse. So we will now see effects of climate emergency, both in London and other cities. Um, but uh, we can still turn the tide around, uh, for want of a better pun. So um, we can do that by making sure we are putting in uh, suitable measures to make sure we are adapting to the climate emergency too. And that's where rewilding has a huge part to play. Absolutely. And I mean, I'd like to turn to um, Simon now. Same question. Where do you think rewilding fits into how we tackle climate change as, as a broader issue? Oh, <laughs> uh, you're, 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 still, you're still muted, I'm afraid. There we go. There we go. Come on, Simon. You've got to get faster than that, mate. Um, right, so basically, uh, rewilding to me is, a, is an accessible way that anybody can get involved with helping the, uh, the climate emergency because whatever space you've got, you can actually bring nature in towards it. Um, and business, I think, has got a great opportunity to re engage uh, with nature. You know, for many years, we've had this adversarial relationship, thousands of years had this adversarial relationship with nature. And we realized nature's always going to win. You know, humans uh, <laughs> have no divine right to be here, whereas nature will always and ultimately win. So let's work with it uh, wherever possible. And, you know, it's interesting that two out of the four uh, people on this screen uh, are actively involved in politics. Uh, politics writes the rules that we work by. And so, you know, I personally... I've got no interest in being a politician, but got a massive interest in changing the world for the better. Um, and so if you want to understand how we can uh, incentivize and take out some of the perverse incentives that we have for taking out nature, um, then you've got to get involved in politics. So for me, rewilding is an accessible way of everybody actively helping with the climate emergency and also learning something about themselves because actually when you're in you know um as Zach mentioned when you when you're in nature when you're involved with nature when you've got soil in your fingers and when you're actually watching and uh, now at this time of year the leaves starting to fall and all this kind of stuff actually you know mentally is a fantastic place to be and physically you feel better when you're outside and uh, and about and even in urban areas there are plenty of green spaces you know I'm here in Barnsley in Yorkshire and uh, on average, people are about 200 yards from either a green space or you know, within the town or 
uh, outside. You know, we, we, it is accessible even in what were formerly heavily industrialized areas. There's, there's a great opportunity to engage with nature. And this is why I'm very interested in rewilding as a, as a subject matter area personally and uh, as a business person mm -hmm. and as a politician. Absolutely. And I mean, you, you, you mentioned um, industry there and, and the uh, way areas that were, were formerly heavily industrial can be uh, uh, rewilded and, and, and can become greener. But I'd like to now turn to um, areas that are uh, perhaps more natural or, or, or closer to nature and have stayed in a, a, a state of um, nature for longer. And that's areas that have been used um, for farming. And of course, one of the big um, debates related to rewilding is how can we ensure that we have um, continued feud security? Um, how can we continue that the, there, there are people still um, growing crops and, and, um, and, and farming whilst also having a balance with rewilding? Now, now Steve, I'd, I'd like your take on it. How do you think we can balance farming and rewilding. Okay, well, uh, in the Scottish Rewilding Alliance and uh, our friends down down south, as we say up here in, in rewilding Britain, would like to see 30% of Scotland and the UK actively being rewilded by 2030. And that sounds like a huge amount of the country. But actually, when you look at where there are the best opportunities to do rewilding, this is often on land which is marginal for agriculture. So when we want, if we want to get 30% rewilded, I mean, where I live in Scotland, it would be dead easy because there's so much uh, semi-natural land already that, that needs a helping hand. So we can, we can easily do that without having a big impact on farming. Um, however, on farmland, we do want to do some rewilding. We would like to see some land rewilding on prime farmland because actually that can help farming as well. So if you set aside strips next to rivers and streams, you can then create pollinator zones, which are really important for farming. We all know about the crisis that our bees are suffering from at the moment. Uh, and if you put beavers into that mix, they'll often do a bit of flood management for you and help your land actually become more productive. However, in the uplands where I am, farming does need to change. Uh, thousands and thousands of people were cleared off the Scottish Highlands a couple of hundred years ago in order to enable sheep farming to happen. And rewilding can actually change all of that by, by, by getting sheep off the land to quite a huge extent. We could see rewilding, we could see repeopling at the same time. But if we just throw tenant farmers off the land, like as happened by one very famous brewing company up here in Scotland, that for me is not just, it's not fair. And it's the, the, the modern day equivalent of what happened to the mining industry in the 1980s under Thatcher. You don't destroy people's lives. You try to do what is increase, increasingly called a trust, uh, uh, sorry, a trust, a just <laughs> transition. So Freud didn't slip, wasn't it? Uh, a just transition. Um, and that's about working with farmers to try to support them to become uh, more nature friendly in their farming. And a fantastic example of that, and there's a brilliant book about it, is a place called Lynbreck up, up in the Cairngorms, where two women have transformed uh, a farm into a place which is, is profitable for them. They've got chickens and beef and all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, but they also are rewilding that land. And it's an absolute place that's buzzing with wildlife as well as making them a living and that's the sort of thinking we need if we're going to overcome this constant conflict between the art farming and, and rewilding for me it's a bit of a false false dichotomy the two can work hand Absolutely. in hand um zach the same question to you how do you think we can have a a, a, a balance between uh farming and rewilding i mean do you agree with steve that it's perhaps easier to get that balance than uh, might uh, be thought by some <laughs> Um, I'll perhaps stop muting myself and make Tom's life yeah. easier. Um, so the first thing, I, I agree entirely with Steve, it's a, a false dichotomy that's often presented, so I can completely understand why the question's being asked, and very often it's almost easier for us to engage with debates if we kind of go, is it this or is it this? But as with so many things around the environment and the climate, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Um, I don't want a trust transition, as Steve puts it, a just transition sounds much better. But if we look at what Liz Truss said this week, uh, she talked about um, the people who are anti-growth. And I think part of that kind of phrasing comes into this question because, you know, we don't want to be anti-growth, but it's about what does growth mean? Now, if growth means GDP, then yes, absolutely, we cannot continue as we go. But if we're talking about growth in terms of our happiness, our well-being, mental health, biodiversity, um, ecology, 
uh, bringing back species, you know, one in six species are currently uh, under threat of extinction, then of course, absolutely, we, we do need growth. So I think this conversation has to be about what sort of growth do we need? Now, if farming is there just to fulfill a bottom line, and there is no kind of consideration about what the land is being used for, what land, uh, what people need, what's healthy for them. Um, I'm also vegan, so I want to put that in there too, because I think there's, you know, a genuine conversation to be had around what sort of farming is there and, and how do we treat animals. So I think all of those things are, are part of this conversation, but I don't think it is farming or rewilding. And in fact, there's plenty of farmers doing brilliant examples where they're using farming to rewild and actually having more rewild farms and finding places where crops can grow better in, in biodiversity. And although that's not as easy to produce at mass scale, there are ways of doing that. I think the last crucial thing I would say is that I'm, you know, business does have a part to play in this. And again, that's part of that that growth, but it has to be sustainable, uh, ethical business. And, you know, I, I, I'm suspicious of techno solutions with any of this. That sometimes we have businesses or particularly politicians just saying oh, things are going to be fine and we're going to create this technology that will, you know, carbon capture or we can carry on going at the rate we are because we'll discover something new and brilliant that will mean we, we can reverse some of the damaging effects. And we can't do that. We know already we have damaged our planet far too badly and too often the most vulnerable people play the effects. So. Uh, rewilding over farming but that does not mean that there's not a place for Absolutely. farming um i'd like to turn now from discussing um farm animals to, to some of the animals that have been proposed to be um, rewilded so one of the concerns people often have regarding rewilding is suggestions of rewilding larger animals such as um bison which were recently rewilded in kent with the fears that they may damage infrastructure attack people etc etc um is something that we should be concerned about or is the worry simply a worry regarding just change um steve uh, what are your thoughts on this do, do you think we should be uh, re-worried about rewilding larger animals or, or do you think that the worries are a bit overblown well i think a lot of people think that rewilding is all about bringing back large animals and it's true if we brought back some of those large animals they'd start to get these natural processes working that, we, that we've lost so you know beavers lynx maybe one day bison have been reintroduced to kent um, and wolves if if we didn't if we had a proper land bridge between us and europe they'd be here already but the problem is uh, we've forgotten how to live with these large animals. So if you go to the Carpathian Mountains, you'll find these big animals everywhere, bears and bison and God knows what else. And people in, people get on absolutely fine with them. Um, but we've just forgotten how to live with them. And that makes getting some of these animals back difficult because in order for it to work, it has to be socially acceptable. Otherwise, it just will fail. People go out and shoot them and take extreme measures. So it's a process. It's a process that for people like me is perhaps frustratingly slow. Uh, but we have to understand that particularly people who feel they have something to lose by change are often really resistant to change. We have to work with them to, to do that. But the really good news is these large animals are more frightened of us than, than we ever need to be of them. I mean, bison attacks are, ne are never are ne next to not, not heard of. Even wild cattle, which have been reintroduced to parts of Europe, you know, attacks are often associated with um, people just um, not realizing they're in the company of a wild animal and spooking it. But they're really, 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 really rare situations. So uh, if we think that these animals are gonna be much more scared of us than we will ever be of them, that's the starting point. And then it's about actually demonstrating in other parts of Europe where these animals are making a massive comeback. It's just not a big deal. But for us it is because we have to make that conscious decision without a land bridge between us and Europe animals can't come back on their own so we have to choose to do so and that's the thing we carry and how, how do we make that uh, process of change easier for people mm -hmm. absolutely um simon what are your thoughts on it do, do you think it's something we should be concerned about or not what, what do you think yeah I, I mean i live literally two miles away from where the last wolf in england was shot uh, in woolly um by woolly edge um and I'd, I'd love personally i'd love to see them i've been in places in the world where there are a lot more large animals that you've been like you've been talking about and it, it, you're right one, the people there know how to deal with them they're not you know and they don't just shoot them on site you know they know how to live alongside them which is the important thing um i think there's a, the the beaver thing seems really interesting in terms of uh, flood management i think that i think if you can show a utility and I, it's a horrible thing to say but if it has human utility you're going to get a lot more people 
um, understanding the benefit of it than if you just say it'd be nice to have them back. Uh, because nobody likes change, no matter what they say. And unless they can see there's a benefit in it somewhere down the line, it's going to be difficult to do. But rewilding, you know, that's 1% of the rewilding kind of ecosystem, if you like. Um, I'm much more interested in, you know, grass verges not being cut down as soon as some, uh, something grows on them. Because those are practical steps that you can do. You know, things like in if you go to Utrecht, all the, the bush shelters have got uh, wonderful uh, meadow land on top of them, you know. And that's turning uh, places which are really u utilitarian into something that's really interesting. Yeah, as autumn's just come about Yellowstone. Some fantastic thing about the change in Yellowstone. That's the one that I've, I've seen as well. But yes, I, I'd love to have more biodiversity. Um, and that's mainly through get, letting nature do its own thing. Um, but yes, as, as Steve was saying, that you know we, we can't expect these ones to just rock up on their own. We would need to make a proactive uh, uh, choice on them. But uh, I think if we focus on the benefits it would deliver, I think you'll get a much greater acceptance of, of that taking place than uh, just saying it'd be nice to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And of course, in, in terms of acceptance and um, support, according to a recent uh, YouGov poll, 81% of Britons support rewilding in some form. How can we ensure uh, that these levels of support continue into the future and don't evaporate as um, support for some other measures has? Um, Zach, if you could start with this question. Uh, thank you very much. Very much. Oh. Um, so I want to jump off the back of, of what Simon was saying there. Oh, I'm back. Yep, I want to jump off the back of what Simon was saying there. Um, ultimately, uh, so I chair the Environment Committee in London, and we recently did an investigation into wild spaces. So we had various people come and give evidence. And a theme that really came across was one of the biggest things we have to do as politicians in London, and I imagine this translates to all over the country as well, is to um, inform people and engage people that actually uh, nature looking messy, for want of a better word, is not a bad thing. And actually people have really been encouraged in kind of past decades to think that very neat lawns and almost astroturf have the way to go. And actually it's incredible that the amount of biodiversity we're losing just because people want things to look very neat, particularly in public parks. And actually we should be encouraging and engaging with communities about why things looking slightly chaotic is actually really, really good for biodiversity and to embrace um, some of that kind of messiness or, or chaos um, of course, there's ways of doing that and there's ways of kind of controlling the chaos. But ultimately, I think, you know, in communities, we need to engage with people and explain that that's not about laziness or it's not about the council not doing what they need to be doing. But actually, it's really, really good um, for the air that we breathe, for the water that we drink and for, for biodiversity by making sure that, that we're allowing that to happen. And then the second thing I think to answer that question is politics for far, uh, far too long has been very top down. So it's been this idea that people have the answers, this kind of paternal and maternal approach to politics, whereas actually in the Green Party, and I know the Yorkshire Party follow a similar ethos too, which is grassroots democracy, which is actually, we should be engaging with communities and it should be communities deciding at the most local level um, what happens to them and, and, and what needs to happen. So for that, we need devolution um, from a Westminster government more than anything, but also anyone engaged with any politics or activism. I think it's about finding uh, someone used this phrase today about literally helping people get their hands in the soil. I was with a Manchester councillor recently who represents the uh, ward of Hume. Hume is a, a pretty unequal ward in terms of there's there's quite a lot of, uh, it's in Manchester, there's lots of wealth there, but there's also mass poverty. Like many of our cities, um, I was in Cambridge last night, which is uh, one of the most unequal cities in the UK. And about uh, essentially finding some of the most kind of uh, poorest communities and working class communities and just making sure that they do have regular access to the soil, regular access to nature, and that there is a genuine immersion in it. There's often this idea of three levels of immersion, zero immersion being you have no nature in your life whatsoever. Level one being you might have a picture of a, you know, a tree or something like that on your living room wall. Number two being that you can go out and walk in nature, but very often we find people are in nature, but they're still reading a book or listening to a podcast. And that's not a bad thing in itself, but really to be immersed in nature, you need to be in the nature, listening to the nature and actually having a visceral experience of what nature feels like. And I think it's those visceral experiences um, that ultimately politicians and activists need to be encouraging within communities, because I think that's how we re-encourage that kind of relationship with the soil. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. I mean, um, Simon, Simon, what do you think in terms of how we can keep the level of support for rewilding that it is? To be honest, I think it's a natural state. People like nature. Uh, if they give themselves the chance, one of the one, one of the very few benefits that came out of COVID was people actually got out of it more. Uh, and active transport is a good way of actually making people keep in nature. And it's obviously good for the environment. And it's actually for, helps with the cost of living crisis, you know, uh, quite a lot as well. Um, so I, I think making it so that people actually understand the benefits that they get from it they've had a taste for it and please don't get back into the cars and get back into the shopping malls when when you've got a chance of uh, of being outside um i i don't think we need to you know actively think oh my goodness so many people are going to dis disappear from the rewilding scene people actually like it and it, you know if you've if you've seen some of the work that's being done in urban areas um it really does change people's perception of the place that they live it makes them feel more proud about it. And if they feel more proud about it and they want to go out more, then it helps them uh, from all sorts of, you know, community, spirit, feeling uh, good about themselves, feeling less lonely, all of those kind of good things. So rewilding helps, if you like, refulfilling people's lives. And, and as a consequence of that, I don't think we need to think that, you know, worry about it, it disappearing. There is the benefit, um, as Zach was saying, about from council point of view, it, it, it actually saves money, which is never a, a bad thing as well in terms of how often that they have to mow, mow areas and all of this. But they ought to put some of that money back into the diversity, the biodiversity of what they're uh, leaving there, rather than just, you know, being active promoters of a wider uh, ecosystem that they can do and engaging you know um, there's a lot of good work that schools do but there's there, there's a training thing I think if you embed that within a bit like voting it's a thing that we kind of take for granted is nature I think if we bring it into the classroom and make people aware of it there's a you know it's a it's, it's an in, a really interesting subject matter area um, but also it helps people to understand how to get their best life by engaging with nature um, and also the political process, because then you vote people in with good ideas, uh, rather than some of the people at Westminster that we have with very, very, very bad ideas. But I'll not go there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Steve, what, what, what do you think can be done to maintain the levels of support for, for rewilding? I think what Simon was sort of saying is, is, is about right, really, which is people actually when you think about it or even if you don't I think sorry let me start again it's actually an emotional reaction to what's going on in the world at the moment so there's a sense that w w the world is kind of out of control we've got you know if I was a when I was a teenager it was nuclear war I think if I was a teenager now I'd be absolutely scared of the climate breaking down and rightly so and I think the thing about rewilding is it is wholly a positive thing it is wholly about can we create a positive future for for nature and the world there's nothing negative about it, really. That's that's the thing that attracted me to want to work in it. Why can't we change the world in a positive way? We seem to be really good at changing the world in, in a negative way, particularly at the minute. So rewilding does give you this positive hope for the future. The challenge is making it happen and, and, and getting some of those people on board who are naturally perhaps dismissive of nature, want to make money as much as possible, rather than actually think that there's a balance between profit and life and, and all life. Those are the big, those are the kind of quite philosophical things that we need to try to, to get past, which is we'd all like to live in a better world. Rewilding is one of the ways of getting to a better world. How do we harness the energy like, like Simon, like Simon's doing in his work of people that you might think are actually going to be you know against nature actually working for it and where I work at Trees for Life you know we have a lot of uh, businesses that want to help with the process want to make make things happen I think that's we're coming on to that a little bit later so it's how do you harness the energy and how do you show the benefits that, that demonstrate that it's actually worth you investing in mm -hmm. absolutely um, and of course we've, we've talked about um, politics and how rewilding often is uh, in, interlinked active um, rewilding with active political change. So uh, finally, um, what are the best ways political parties, government of all levels, um, businesses who are supportive of rewilding uh, can support it both on a larger scale, on a, on a, on a smaller scale as well? How best can, can politics help rewilding? Zach, uh, if you could respond to that first. 
Thanks, Will. I think this question is crucially because ultimately it's a solutions-based question, isn't it? We've identified the problems. What is it we can we can all do to help and make things better? Um, and thank you for congratulating me on becoming deputy leader of the Green Party. It only happened last month. So I've been having a deep think about this, as I think any of us will have, depending on you know where we are within our lives and what we want to change and how can we make the most impact. And people have various you know sizes of platforms, but actually with that platform, what are the things you want to concentrate on? And then also crucially, how do you want to share that platform? So if I give you two examples of, of things I've done in London, slightly taking off my national hat and just putting on my environment chair hat on. Now, both of these stories aren't intended to bash uh, London Mayor Sadiq Khan because he's not here to defend himself. And I don't think, you know, he's the worst politician in the world, but I do think there are some big gaps in his plans around the environment. And I think these two stories both kind of highlight a gap in how we need more community activism. So within the, a month of me being elected um, a couple of years ago as um, a London Assembly member, I was allowed to ask Sadiq Khan um, some questions for six minutes um, live on, on BBC. And so the, the questions I decided to ask him in the chamber were around citizens' assemblies, the idea that I've been elected, but actually I wanted to bring people's voices into City Hall, because actually I think no one understands better their local communities and their local green spaces than the people who live by them and have seen the degradation that's gone on or the development that's gone on. And obviously I can have a sense of that on a national level and a regional level. But again, if it's literally your park that you can see outside your window or you walk through the kid, you know, walk through the kids, then you have a better sense of it. And his response to me was was shocking. He just said that I'd just been elected and I was in danger of making myself redundant. And I think it's that kind of political attitude we really need to change, the idea that politicians have all the answers. Actually, we need to cast the net out wide and make sure we're using people's wisdom. So then the second part of that is something I'm trying to set up in London. is something called a London Climate Panel. And I'd hope this could be replicated in any city. And it's the idea that rather than going to big organisations like Friends of the Earth or Greenpeace, who are doing brilliant work, and it's not to disparage that, but it's a different kind of work to those very hyper local groups that are protecting trees or are arguing, you know, that they need another park bench in their, their local village because actually people want to sit down and enjoy, you know, hearing the birds sing or they want to campaign against noise pollution about noisy traffic or want another segregated cycle lane for active travel. So I said that we need these hyper local groups and we should really be bringing them into City Hall and using their expertise and wisdom to then inform policy. So you're rather than deciding you've got the answers and then notifying, you do genuine consultation. And I think that's a theme throughout all of these things, that we want consultation, not notification. And um, a key part of this, though, is that we need to compensate those people for their time and labour. You can't find people from working class communities or people of colour who are often ignored and say, we want all your expertise and wisdom, but also we're not going to compensate you for this with some money. And I think that's a really key point. And the mayor said to me that I shouldn't knock good citizenship. And I think, again, that's a wrong attitude towards how we engage people and communities in a serious way where we're genuinely showing that we want people's expertise and we actually value that. And you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be an environmentalist to do that. You can just be someone who thinks that seeing foxes in your local area is actually exciting um, and not just foxes. Those are the most typical example in an urban area. But actually, there's lots of nature that people don't see and, and we should be seeing more. And Steve was talking earlier about those keystone species as well and reintroducing certain species into into the, the ecosystem, uh, doing that carefully, but knowing that's going to protect other species and trees. And so to answer your question, this has been a, a longer answer, but I think it's probably one of the most important subjects we'll talk about, because really it's about how do you engage every single person in rewilding? Because this will not work if it's just a few, uh, no offence to anyone on this panel, I'm in this sector too, but policy wonkish. It can't be about people who really understand you know, the policy and the numbers. It has to also be people who have their hands in the soil, people who know the land. Uh, and I know Steve and Simon do that too, so it wasn't a slight. Um, but making sure that all of those voices and all of those aspects are in there um, and also we have an all-male panel I think women have a crucial role to play in this too and also recognizing traditionally other you know different roles that people have as well uh, and again you know we should have got past those basic gender roles too now but just making sure that everyone's voices are included and this is a diverse community approach to making sure everyone's involved with protecting the environment. Mm -hmm, absolutely um Simon, what, what are your thoughts about how political parties, government, businesses can support rewilding, large and small? Um, well, obviously, 
as a business person, uh, I've, I've taken a very proactive role in this in that I, I looked at my business and I've always, I run it slightly different. I look at, uh, it's a Marxist capitalist business, which sounds an oxymoron, but fundamentally we use capitalism to create the value and then we use Marxism to share out the value. Now we had a lot of money in the bank. We've never borrowed any, we made, we made it. And I just thought, how can I add utility intellectually, emotionally, and financially to the people. So I use some of the cash to buy uh, the Wedmar Oxygen Farm, as it's called, which is an area that we've rewilded. And the idea, most people said, how do you do that within a business? Well, actually, it's really straightforward. If you've got cash as an asset, you turn it into land, it's still an asset. So it doesn't actually cost you anything. And then you rewild it. And so that's what we've, we've done. We've, got, we've now put 25 ponds on there. Uh, we've planted up to 13,000 trees, I think the latest uh, the latest count. We've got an eco lodge and we've got a second one going on because we want everybody in Webmark, there's 42 of us, each family has a free week there. And the change that that makes to their relationships with their families, uh, the time that they have out there is fabulous to do. So that's a practical step that any business can do that has got spare cash. And there are a lot of companies with cash. It's just changing your mindset about what the business is for. It's maximizing shareholder values is so old school. If you can maximize the value for the community, for your employees, for, your, for the environment using that asset, that's a really practical step you can do. And anybody who's interested in that, just get in touch with me and I'll show them how I did it. And it's not that difficult because um, I did it. Um, the, the other thing on a macro level, is and the reason that I've moved some of my time into politics is we've got to get towards carbon tax. It's a you know, if you're, there's one thing in the world I would like to do to make capitalism work, well, capitalism is fantastic at creating wealth, but it's really, really, really bad at sharing it out, and it doesn't take any account of externalities of there or are they euphemistically called. You get a carbon tax in then it works really well because there's an opportunity cost for polluting, for degrading the environment. So that's, that's a really important thing from a political point of view. And then on a practical level, as, uh, as that was saying about, you know, we call it subsidiarity, uh, subsidiarity, as in the people on the ground, really empowering them and allowing them to do the things that they should be able to do. There's a planning issue there that we need to change, but there's also a, a, an a attitudinal thing there that everything can be beautiful. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, nothing that is in our built environment or our natural environment cannot be enhanced by rewilding. And so this is those, you know, I think they said that, uh, I think it's Highways England is the second biggest landowner in the country. You know, all those grass verges and all of that kind of stuff, you know, there's a huge opportunity to engage with organisations like that to do. And that's where po politics really can help them. So there's a two way thing, business and politics, both of them can work in, in parallel to help rewilding, but it's a change of attitude that is needed mm -hmm. and an education. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you for um, answering uh, my questions. I'm going to move on to uh, some of the questions and comments uh, that we've had uh, come in over the past uh, half hour. I'm going to start with this question first for Steve, because I think it's a, an interesting one to, to kick off with. And it's from um, Marjorie. Um, how much of a threat do you think is the government's um, potential scrapping of the ELM scheme and what can be done about it? OK, so the ELM scheme applies to England and Wales, doesn't apply to Scotland. So we don't have it up here, but I know that down south, the, the Boris Johnson government, one of their flagships was actually demonstrating freedom from Europe enabled us to do agriculture differently. And I know some very wealthy capitalist people who voted Brexit, not because of they wanted to make lots of money, but, but because they felt that, that it could free agriculture. Um, and it looks to me that what's happening in, with the Liz Trust government is trying to revert to type and actually not uh, just subsidise agriculture for the, for the sake of subsidising farmers. And I don't think that's a good model. I think uh, paying farmers for uh, benefits, whether that's food or whether that's nature, is, is a really good model that, that we should be following. Um, it's a small scheme compared to the overall agricultural budget. It was a trial really for England. But what we do need to do is lobby to keep that. 
and lobby also to, 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 to move some of that money that goes into agriculture, you know, that pays farmers just for having sheep on their land rather than actually the benefits that a sheep or any other animal might bring uh, it is not a good model. What is it that we want out of farming? Uh, and we want a mixture of food and we want a mixture of, of, of benefits uh, for nature and for people as well. That's what we should be pay, paying farmers for, not just just a, you know, a headage payments or a standard land payment, which is where I thought the, tr mm -hmm. the trust government was going. So fight it. There's there's a petition by the RSPB at the moment that you can sign up to, which is about saying, you know, this is ridiculous. Stop it. Whatever. whatever and these these economic, whatever they're called, zones, just, you know, no standards whatsoever. Zones, I think they should be called again, a massive threat to nature and a massive threat to rewilding. Uh, we have to start standing up and fighting, I'm afraid, uh, and standing up for what we want and not allow, allow an, I'm, I'm ranting, <laughs> forgive me, not allow an unelected government to change our country in two years, which is what it's got. So time to stand up, Marjorie. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities. Yeah, clearly to do that. Uh, a bit of a... <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to be apolitical and I failed miserably. <laughs> <forgive me. laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Um, I'd like to move on to a question now from um, Roxanne, who says, um, if we suggest uh, the fact that we have to have 30% of land rewilded, as, as an example she gives, what does the label rewilded entail? When will we have decided that we have arrived in such a state? What do the characteristics of such areas need to be? Simon, if you could start with your response to this question. I'd love to uh, re reply with that. I've got no idea, except that if it looks nice and it offers biodiversity that allows a multiplicity of little insects, organisms, and bigger things to live, then that's that's rewilded in my. I'm not, you know, I'm not a scientist on that one, but uh, you know, you can tell when things look rewilded and when they look, um, you know, aesthetically appealing and a uh, higher degree of utility for nature than it would have been with, without. I think if you know this, the, there are a lot of people better than me that could come up with a a, a more empirically valid um, description of it. But it it really is a needed to um, be on the radar screen that this is a metric. You know, if you can get if you can get a number on it, as in it's, you know, one is um, denuded and ten is fully enriched, then uh, you know, let's tr let's try and work that way because the trouble is, if it's less subjective, then there'll be a lot of people, especially if there's money attached to it, like we'll get and end up with greenwashing on rewilding. You know, that you need to have it so that it, it, it's objectively assessed rather than just down to subjective assessment. But you still don't stop you doing whatever you can to. Uh, on any place that you've got, any space that you've got to, uh, you know, make it as, as uh, biodiverse as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Zach, if you, if you could um, give your response to this question, what, what do you think that um, would be a, a good way of uh, a, a arriving in, in the state that Roxanne suggests? What characteristics do you think that there needs to be? Well, I think these last two questions actually linked together. And, and Steve mm -hmm. said he didn't want to rant, but I think everyone should be ranting at the moment. At these uh, investment zones. Essentially, when Liz Truss talks about deregulation, it means sewage in our rivers. Um, and it also means cuts to public services. And I think that message can't be heard loud and often enough. And I imagine that the people on this call are already aware of that. But I, I think it's important that we do all speak to our friends, family, colleagues um, about these things, because there is, you know, essentially a coup going on at the moment we know she and it's not even that secret she wrote a book or co-wrote a book called Britannia Unchanged which outlined how all of these things are going to happen and nature in there has no kind of value to a Liz Trust government other than to be there to be made money and that's why I've always been skeptical of phrases like natural capital and um, the idea that our green spaces are assets now I understand that there is a need to have a directory of what green spaces we have and understand the value of those green spaces but that value should not purely be corporate or just you know for capitalism and so we need to be careful with that so to come on to this latter question um again I, i'm not a, an ecologist and i think they're the ones who should be deciding what are the criteria that, that we need for green spaces and to make those clear metrics simon's exactly right if there's any slippery wriggle room on that for the exact question that steve was answering that wriggle room will be used because they're looking for it to further deregulate so we need much clearer standards and then just as an addendum to, to both of these questions, something we've not talked about, but I'm very passionate about is urban food growing. 
And I think that's, you know, something that comes with them rewilding that we really need to encourage, particularly in a cost of living crisis, to be able to give people, particularly in cities, the opportunity to be able to grow their own food. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a launch of a new handbook called Growing for Change. Uh, Growing for Change, you can find it out online. Um, and essentially, this was um, a campaign called The Right to Grow, which is saying that if you have space that has been abandoned or is not being used, it shouldn't be on the um, member of the public of a community to have to apply to grow food on that space. They should be able to grow food on that space. And then if there's a complaint, then actually the owner should be on the, the landowner to explain why they can't have people growing on this big empty space where we could be growing food that could be feeding people again, particularly in a cost of living crisis. And I think the rules of engagement are all the wrong way around. Well, Whereas the onus is on the community to create pages and pages of outrageous planning rules and planning permissions just to be able to do something that would be incredibly natural, which is to grow their own food. And then on the final, while I'm going really, really deep green on this, compost toilets as well. I think in cities, there's this brilliant opportunity to actually get compost toilets, particularly in public parks, as an opportunity for volunteers and community groups to be able to not think of waste as something that is awful or something we need to get rid of, but actually waste is a part of the ecosystem. We should be encouraging it and for particularly young people to understand how that waste can go back into nature and what an incredible, beautiful process that is. And I think it would have us all rethinking about how do we interact with the environment and, and what does waste do. And I think all of those things require um, regulation and not deregulation. So we've got to fight this uh, every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think you must either be a psychic or I've been having a, a look at the chat, Zach, because we have in fact just had a, a comment related to urban farming. Um, and, 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 and on that subject of urban farming, being able to um, introduce an, an, an element of rewilding in cities and, and, and using um, not, not even, you know, uh, necessarily the biggest acres of land uh, for rewilding. I mean, what what contribution do you think um, that could have to helping the environment? Steve, what do you think? Do you mean uh, urban farming land? Is that, is, is that, is yes, that where yes, yes. Is? yes. Well, it's how it's. I used, I used to live in Bristol before I before I came to Scotland, and I used to have a double allotment. It was fantastic. I used to grow most of my own food, and but also was very aware that that space was a, an important space for nature. So it is about how you grow your food. So my neighbour on the allotment next door was a chemi chemical alley of sort of um, allotments. You know, his allotment was pristine. It was it was amazing, really. If you if you know sort of allotment that probably would have been award, awards where if you looked at mine it was a bit weedy it was a bit of a mess in places there was bits I couldn't cultivate uh, and so I just left it to nature so it's actually that thing that, that I mentioned at the start working with nature instead of against it so you know using what nature can do to help you correct get food as opposed to annihilating nature which is what my neighbor did in order to get a bit a much more bumper crop than mine but I had a surplus so I had more food than I could cope with in, in the height of the season so um, I was happy and I think that's that's about that's how, how we need to think about it how do we work with nature how do we take what nature can give us uh, and benefit both ourselves and nature that's that's a philosophical change we need to make in our heads as a, as a society. Mm, absolutely I mean Simon what, what are your thoughts on on urban farming? Well, I think you know there's a lot of money going into urban farming, but not on this, not on the allotment end. I mean, allotment. Um, you know, the, the, if you look at uh, certainly in in the Netherlands, the, there's a huge amount of growth uh, done locally because of freshness, because of reducing food miles, because of uh, low impact, low carbon food creation, particularly for you know green leaves and salads and and things like that. So I do think that that will come. Uh, no, there's no ifs and buts about it from a resilience point of view from a you know a, a bit like you know 50 years ago went into uh, uh, intense uh, cultivation of chickens and things like that you know that we will go in a more uh, vegan friendly um, way but have it created locally rather than shipped around in big lorries and, and what have you um, certainly it, up in the north it was a the, rather like within Bristol it was a huge uh, thing was having an allotment because you know if you work down the pit getting upside outside and get seeing a bit of fresh air and doing that was you know way before way before our time we were understanding the value of nature and the value of getting outside and local cultivation of our foodstuffs 
um, not to mention pigeons and ferrets. But it was, um, yeah. So I, th I do think that, that there is a lot, to, lot to be said for it. And I think you're, you're right. It's a change of attitude. Messy is good, even if you have a bit of your garden messy, even if the edges messy, rather than you know have some element of your your garden pristine, so you can play football on it. But the rest of it, if you've got a garden like that. You know the rest of it have around the borders. Make it as as diverse as you possibly can. Every you know square meter counts. And I think if we can get that in our head, look around. What what can we cultivate? If you look at, yeah, ironically, um, uh, places like China. Every kilometer in China, every river has a water um, warden on it uh, to check the quality of it, and also to keep the the banks clear and nice and wonderful and all that kind of stuff. I think if we can do that on a micro level here, you know, each road that we're on, let's see what we can do. You know, the road that we live on, the area that we we, we play near, let's see if there is an opportunity to, uh, you know, ch change, change the dial, you know, and let's take a bit of civic pride in making these places as rewild as possible. And that goes back to, you know, certainly the thing that the Yorkshire Party strongly believes in and their Greens, you know, it, it's in our hands, a lot of this. We can do it if we, uh, if we uh, organise ourselves and actually make it a really, really, uh, a, I suppose, a, a socially acceptable and positive thing to do in mm, our lives. Absolutely. Um, I've got a question here from someone called Torin. I don't know who that is. Uh, he asks, uh, how can we ensure that the political parties support rewilding more publicly? Zach, what, what are your thoughts about how we can uh, ensure that? Thank you. Well, I guess you could run events and and invite people to come and speak on it so well, to the think tank and so i just wanted to build up on what simon and stephen were just talking about because I, I agree with every word that practically needs to happen and that we talk about the cost of living crisis and the climate crisis but i also think we have a civility crisis in society in terms of how people talk to each other and the divisions in society whether that's a rise in uh, homophobia transphobia anti-semitism islamophobia all of those things and actually if there's a beautiful metaphor here of different people from different places all getting along and actually embracing that chaos and that is biodiversity and very often in the green party when i talk about social justice issues on the media and um, don't get me wrong the vast majority of the party absolutely support what i'm saying and there's always just a couple of voices that go but the green party should just be there for the environment but as i said at the very beginning there's no environmental justice without social racial and economic justice too and i think that's an understanding of the phrase simon just talked about which is civic pride both pride in uh, your own space and the environment around you, but pride mm -hmm. in the citizens and the people who make up that space and understanding to recognize difference, to appreciate difference, to not need hom homogeneity, I struggle with that word, but actually recognizing that biodiversity, both in people and nature is absolutely something we should be encouraging. In terms of how can we get politicians to support it more actively, I didn't think I was going to talk about this um, on this panel uh, because it feels a bit left field. But since we've got there, I think the thing that's holding us back more than anything in society is our broken voting system of first past the post. It too often results in this ridiculous binary between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. And so often that either means the worst possible party to vote for or a party that is the least bad. And I think if we have proportional representation, again, that would encourage a diversity of views. Now, the media seem to love this kind of... Uh, uh binary which is what we talked about before with farming versus rural wilding and actually i think all of us in society can encourage more nuanced complex ecosystem debates that require a variety and a multitude of views that can be more chaotic but actually results in a better conversation and better discourse because we all have to work together i'm elected to the london assembly one of the few bodies in the uk that uses proportional representation other than the scottish parliament and, and soon the, the senate as well um, but actually what that encourages is that I have to work with politicians from other parties. We have to negotiate. We have to find messy compromises sometimes. And I think that results in a better politics and a better policy making than just one or two parties holding all the power. So to directly answer your question, rather than spinning off on my rant now, I think uh, having a better voting system would mean that we could actually hold politicians to account and it would mean vested interests would be a lot less at the forefront of politics and the media. And I think people want nature. They want greener spaces. They want biodiversity. We're a country, I think, that do love animals. And I think if we had all of this and we had a fair voting system, we would see that better represented. Far too often now under the broken voting system, we see vested interests. And that's why we get the politics we get. 
and that is you know talking about voting systems can sound abstract and a bit kind of distant from people's real concerns but actually people's real concerns are heavily being affected by a lack of democracy in this country so how can we get better rewilding we need better democratic representation Mm -hmm. uh simon uh what do you think how can we uh get political parties to more publicly support rewilding what zach said <laughs> i mean yeah, being being brutally honest you know we've we have got the trust government in who've not been elected by anybody other than the slack handful of old people because that is what the conservative party is um I, it was interesting. I was in Scotland for the for, uh, independence election and they allowed 16 year olds to vote. And in that and, and it was the, the quality of the debate was fabulous. And, you know, obviously people are not taught about this, their superpower of voting. You know, people, you know, you look at the demographic of, of the electorate, people who actually vote, old people, lots of them, young people, very few. And yet, of course, the future really is for, for the young people. PR means that at least you get your vote counting. So yeah, it's it, of course it's important. And similarly, having a strong regional government, you know, the reason that Germany, Sweden, Holland, Denmark, X, and all of the OECD so, uh, it, it have got a better regional representation and more sensible policies is because they've got a federalist kind of approach to government. We haven't. 6% of our revenue is raised and kept lo uh, locally. You look at Sweden, it's nearly 40%. And therefore they can do more relevant things. They have to, they're beholden to their local electorate much more. Because these people, I mean, bear in mind, the trust government decided to have the most ludicrous mini budget and Bunked 65 billion of our money up a wall uh, unnecessarily. I mean, hello, how can the, how can this kind of thing happen? So yeah, that's my rant. I'm not a big one for ranting, but you know, you look at this, and it is it, it, there is a huge democratic deficit, and there's an awful lot of common sense in our community, and generally people are really nice and really want to do the right thing and look after each other and this, do this, that, and the other, and the political process absolutely stops that happening so this is why i'm in politics i'm sure that's why steve will be at some stage i'm absolutely sure you know because we need people like us to actually make that call actually call out the people the vested interests and put some energy effort and uh desire behind it and work collaboratively across the political divide with people who have a similar view not adversarially mm -hmm. And that's why it's quite interesting to have this uh, debate here about rewilding, because it does matter and it is relevant to the political and socioeconomic issues that we've got. It really is. And um, we're coming towards uh, the end of our hour. But before um, we end, I'd, I'd just like to ask each of you, um, for the people who've been watching this, who will be watching it when it goes up on um, Centre's website as well, what would you like them to take away from this event about rewilding? What would you like them to take away about rewilding? Think about rewilding. Steve, if you could start. Um, well, I think the first thing to say, it's a journey. So I've been looking at Roger's comments. So for the quite frustrated around where well, we haven't got a definition of rewilding. Uh, and, and I quite like the fact there isn't a good definition of rewilding because it means we can kind of be quite active about what, what it means and what it achieves. But at its simplest, if you imagine it's a scale, like Simon said, zero rewilding is a car park on the top of a roof somewhere. Five might be sort of regenerative farming. Um, and 10 is when we can actually let, let nature do its own thing completely. Most parts of the UK, even where I work in the Highlands of Scotland, is a long way from 10, nature being able to take care of itself because we've messed it up for so long. But it's a journey and it's a process and everybody can do something. Everybody can do something directly or indirectly. So I guess come and join the movement, really, and, and do something and get active are the, the two, two things I think I would, I would uh, ask people to think mm, about. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Simon, what would you like people to take away from this event? I think the, for, from my point of view, I look at things in um, an individual level. You are, it's down to you what you can, can do. Try and engage with people, other people locally, and see what you can do to make your uh, area 
a little bit better at a micro level, at a street level, at a village level, at a area of, uh, you know, a state that you're doing, because there are a lot of people like you out there. Don't ever think you're alone. There'll be a lot of people that don't realise just how much better you can make your lived environment by getting together and, you know, putting a bit of time in and, and some thought into that area. I think at a business level, realise that you have got a huge amount of opportunity to help your employees make your business better by using some of the assets that you have in your organization in a much more environmentally friendly way look at your car parks look at the areas around your buildings look at the your balance sheet and see if you can move some of the money from one asset into something which will be much more environmentally sensitive we've done it we're not there's nothing magical about what we've we've done but we've created a magical place and i've now got 42 families that are enjoying and a better working experience and a better family relationship because of the Webmart Oxygen Farm. And thirdly, get involved in politics, uh, either just by voting. It doesn't, I don't care who you vote for, as long as it isn't the Conservative Trust government. Um, but just, just vote. Use your vote and, and in, encourage other people to vote at every level because it really is the way that we're going to change the rules of the game to make rewilding and other... Um, place-based, environmentally friendly and sustainable uh, initiatives actually turn into reality at scale. So politics is important um, and uh, please just use your, your effort, your intellect, your ability in whatever way you can to make that difference. Thank you very much. And finally, Zach, what would you like people to take away from this event? Um, so very much echo what Stephen Simon said again, actually, but I think a bit of thing I would add that is for people to recognise their own power, which is we have a Conservative government that hopes we will all uh, feel like there's no way through, that we'll all lose hope. And actually, they make things particularly complicated or difficult. So there's a sense in the country that there's nothing you can do. And I think we absolutely have to resist that at every moment. So to recognise your own power and know that if it's just one of you or preferably a group of you that are fighting to protect a tree or a green space or to stop a development in an inappropriate place, then actually the power of collective action is so strong. And to show solidarity to those people who are already in those spaces campaigning and see, yes, is there a local group you can help out with? I obviously, the temptation was to say, join the Green Party, because that's my answer to, to everything. But actually, Simon's point is true as well, is this isn't about joining just one particular party or voting for one particular party. It's about getting involved, getting your hands in the soil and, and becoming active. And I think that is a really important message. Fantastic. Well, thank you uh, to the panel for coming to this event. Thank you for everyone for uh, watching it. Next month, we're going to be having a panel on just this reform. So I hope if anybody has um, enjoyed this, I hope all of you have enjoyed it, uh, you'll sign up for that event. So thank you once again and speak to you all soon.